Rare or highly sought after games exist on almost every console, whether they be rare due to a limited number of copies produced, or just happen to be pricey because the demand is too high. Some games just didn't sell when they first came out, and then years later people realized that they were good, and then they became cult classics, like Earthbound for example. Literally no one cared about that game when it came out, and now it's super expensive for no reason. A game's aftermarket value doesn't necessarily correlate to the quality of the game though, and plenty of extremely expensive games are actually pretty terrible. Conversely, there are plenty of amazing games that didn't sell well or came out too late, and most people didn't get the chance to experience them, and now you have to sell your soul to afford a legitimate copy. So today, I'm gonna be taking a look at what I think are the best and worst rare or heavily sought after games. In today's case, we're looking specifically at Nintendo home consoles. All right, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna go down the list of Nintendo consoles by generation, and I'll pick what I think is the best and worst rare or expensive games out of each console's library. Like all the other videos I've done so far, we're gonna do one best and one worst per console. Going into this, I had planned on doing all of them, but after doing some research, I realized the Wii doesn't really have any rare games anymore. The Wii U just barely does, and the Switch is too current to even try to make any kind of judgment about rarity in the library. So for this video, we're gonna go from NES to GameCube. Honorable mention for best and worst on Wii U, though, will go to Axiom Verge and Devil's Third. I, uh, don't really think I need to tell you which one is which. Mr. Gimmick is a game we never got in America, but is honestly one of the best and also one of the most difficult platformers on the console. You play as this little green Waddle Dee looking thing. He's actually a toy that this little girl receives as a gift in the opening cutscene. The other toys, I guess, arrange a mutiny, and now it's your job to go find the girl, I think. At least that's what I get from the cutscene. So as I said, this is a platformer, but it's very different from other games. It's very momentum based. It's as if everything is an ice level and there's slopes all over the place, which either make the game more difficult or more streamlined depending on the confidence you play it with. Your basic attack is this star that can be formed above your head by holding B. And once it's charged, it can be thrown. And even your attack itself is physics based. It bounces off walls and the floor, so you need to really attack with purpose as opposed to just shooting all willy nilly like you would in something like Mega Man. It can also be jumped on top of and serves as another platforming mechanic required to reach some areas. The game is incredibly hard, but super rewarding if you can manage to get the hang of it. There are some really cheap spots, but more often than not, the challenges the game throws at you just require you to really pay attention and learn what precise movements are necessary to conquer them. With the amount of borderline unplayable garbage that clutters a lot of the NES library, it's a shame that a game this ambitious and different never made its way to the US. And now, if you want to import a Japanese copy, it's a lot of money. Ever since I started collecting games years ago, I always heard about how terrible Cheetah Man 2 is. It's just common knowledge at this point. But until now, I never actually played the game for myself. And uh, boy howdy do I need a stiff drink. This is just one of those things that you kinda need to experience yourself. Talking about it doesn't do the game justice at all. So I'm running this game from an EverDrive on my retro USB AVS, and at first the game wouldn't run on my EverDrive. Now, this is no fault of the game, really. Just, some games just either need a firmware update to work, and some just won't work at all due to the nature of how NES cartridge hardware actually works. More often than not though, firmware updates are dropped and the games work just fine. Here's the kicker though, I didn't know it ran just fine. Because of the fact that the game wouldn't run at all, once I actually got it to run and it booted up to so many graphical issues, I got frustrated thinking the game still wasn't working right. It wasn't until I looked up other playthroughs on YouTube that I realized, no, it actually is running just fine, the game is just that bad. It's hard to explain just how this game feels, but I think the biggest problem I have is that despite being a platformer that requires you to evade enemies, you literally cannot short hop or influence the velocity of your jump in any way. If if you press B, yes, B, not A, you shoot directly up into the air at a fixed rate. I couldn't get past the first stage. It's near impossible to avoid a lot of the enemies and I got a game over within five minutes. At the time of this video, the game is worth over a thousand dollars and I honestly think I'd pay that much money to never have to play it again. Hagane is another game that's super difficult. It's also super rewarding once you actually get the hang of it, and there's quite a bit of depth to the controls. It's also the most japanese game I've played in a while, which is probably why the game didn't sell very well since, back then, American media tried to shield everyone's eyes from anything remotely Japanese. Like Brock's delicious homemade donuts. You play as a quote-unquote cyborg ninja named Hagane, despite him looking more samurai than anything. You have your standard sword akin to how you attack in Ninja Gaiden, as well as a chain, shuriken, and grenades. Different weapons work better for different applications applications, kind of like in Castlevania, but swapping between them is cumbersome and there's also limited ammunition. You can, however, swap weapons while the game is paused, which definitely does help, but at the expense of a break in pace. There's also a couple super limited use magic attacks that can clear the screen of enemies. At first, I thought I had to be super careful around enemies, but eventually, as I got more comfortable with the controls and realized there were even more options for dodging and attacking out of a dodge, I got way more confident and the game became a billion times more fun. At the start of the game, I kept dying so quickly to the swarms of enemies 
enemies that the game throws at you, and by like 20 minutes in, I was able to clear stages while barely getting hit. It's a lot of trial and error to progress, kind of like in Mega Man. I actually do like that type of difficulty, but unfortunately, this game's biggest downfall is the fact that despite having unlimited continues, getting a game over starts you from the beginning of whatever chapter you're on, all which house multiple levels. So if you're at the very end of a chapter and you get a game over, you have to start multiple stages back. This kind of lives and continue system do not work well for a game where you need to learn through trial and error, and it's a huge blemish on an otherwise solid game. Still though, this game is great and totally worth playing. Just maybe play it with save states. So, for whatever reason, back in the mid-90s, someone thought it was a good idea to make a Super Nintendo game based on the 1995 live-action Casper movie. It's uncommon, and it's not good. It's a sort of puzzle exploration game, and is actually running on a modified version of the A Boy and His Blob engine. And that's about the only interesting thing about this game. You control Casper, who's followed by Cat Harvey, and you have to explore the mansion and save Cat's dad, all while protecting Cat every step of the way. This is incredibly annoying, because nearly every single time you enter a new room that has enemies in it, Cat will duck down down and stay in place until you clear the room of enemies. Combat, if you can call it that, is a frustrating, clunky mess. Throughout the game, you collect items that let Casper transform into them, and to defeat enemies, you need to transform into whatever items the enemies are weak to. This includes throwaway enemies, as well as bosses, which come in the form of Casper's uncles. You also occasionally have to use items to progress, like this hole in the floor that Cat can't jump down unless you turn into a stupid pillow to catch her. Or don't. You go through the mansion at a snail's pace, which consists of over a hundred rooms which for the most part all look pretty similar, with the goal of collecting a bunch of jars which contain the fuel necessary to get the machine that can save Cat's dad operational. You pretty much crawl back and forth from room to room collecting things and clumsily fighting off swarms of enemies. This game is just a big, boring slog with clunky controls, ugly pixel art, and a repetitive soundtrack that pretty much just consists of one unpleasant sounding loop that you've been listening to this whole time. I'm pretty confident that I can think of at least three better ways to spend spend hundred dollars. The sequel to Bomberman 64 is pretty elusive. It's also pretty good, as far as the list of rare N64 games go anyway. So the game's pretty cutscene heavy and starts off with Bomberman flying around space. His ship gets sucked into a black hole, he blacks out, and wakes up in prison for some reason. This creature named Pommy hatches out of the egg that Bomberman was carrying with him, and now the two need to figure out how to break free. So, with the help of Pommy, you have to make your way through the first stage, beat the boss, and then we meet a character named Lilith. She then tells us that to escape the black hole we were sucked into, we need to find and destroy the gravity generators that lie in the core of each planet found in inside the little solar system inside the black hole, and these planets serve as the game's stages. There's actually quite a bit more to the story. As I said, there's a lot of cutscenes, and the game is surprisingly very story-driven, but at its core, Bomberman's second attack is a sort of puzzle platformer. I wouldn't fully call it a platformer because you can't jump or anything, but there are plenty of elements the game shares with the genre. It's first and foremost about puzzles and combat via the bombs. It's also pretty difficult and the bosses are frustrating, but I do overall think it's a pretty good game. The N64 doesn't exactly have a huge selection of rare games, or, uh, games. So the pool is pretty shallow, but this game is definitely among the best of them and worth your time, especially if you've played the first game. As I've said before, I unironically really like Clay Fighter 63 and a third. And when I found out there was an extremely hard to find expanded director's cut of the game, I was super excited. And then I played it. Clay Fighter Sculptor's Cut is hot garbage. They added some new characters, but that's about the only positive thing this game has going for it. They removed a big chunk of the combo system, multiple special moves were removed, and the game's entire menu and assets look like it's a beta. A lot of 3D elements are replaced with, like, really bad static images, like here on the character selection screen or the little backstory demos. I mean, look at this game over screen. What is this? Earthworm Jim is now locked behind a secret character gate for some reason, and the whole game is just sloppy. I know a lot of people already don't like Clay Fighter 63 and a third, so coming from someone who actually does like that game, you can only imagine how terrible Sculptor's Cut must actually be. It's a bad version of Clay Fighter 63 and 3rd, so for those who already don't like the original game, this is double bad. It's been said that this was a blockbuster exclusive only available to rent and was never commercially available, and judging by the lack of effort or polish, I can totally believe that. So I'm kinda cheating with this one, but the Game Boy Player Startup Disc is the best rare game the GameCube has to offer. With it, you expand the library of your GameCube by thousands of games. Without it, you have a giant paperweight screwed to the bottom of your console. I know the Game Boy Player can use custom software, which is actually a lot better than the original Game Boy Player software, but that's still not super accessible to casual players, and the amount of times I've seen the Game Boy Player being sold without the necessary software to run it is staggering. The Game Boy Player allows you to play the entire library of the Game Boy, Game Boy Color, and Game Boy Advance 
Advance, all on the big screen. It's basically the true successor to the Super Game Boy and improves on it in every possible way, except for its one Achilles heel, the elusive disc that you need to actually use the add-on, which apparently every kid in America managed to lose. It's actually insane how often I see a Game Boy player at a thrift store and almost 100% of the time the disc is nowhere to be found. It's a shame because I know there are tons of people who don't know any better who buy the Game Boy player only to take it home and realize they can't even use it. Because the disc is somehow far more uncommon than the hardware itself, it commands a pretty hefty price on sites like eBay, even with the existence of custom software. The Game Boy Player disc isn't technically a game, but it is an uncommon disc that houses software that allows you to play an enormous library of some of the best games ever made. A while back in my Bad Disney Games video, I covered probably the worst skateboarding game I've ever played, Disney Sports Skateboarding. This is another game from a series where Konami basically reused the same engine for a bunch of sports games based on Disney characters, and they're all terrible. Why the basketball one specifically is so much more valuable than the others is a mystery to me, but in any case, Disney Sports Basketball is a pretty pricey game, and it also happens to, much like the skateboarding one, be the worst version of whatever game it's trying to be. I couldn't play this for more than 20 minutes. The gameplay is clunky and messy, the court is tiny, so combined with the big character models, everything just feels super cluttered. The computer's AI is for some reason on like expert mode at all times, and it's got the same irritating announcer incessantly spouting random nonsense the entire time, just like the skateboarding game did. He keeps calling Goofy the Goof Master, the Goof Master, the master of all goof. Anyway, this is probably the worst basketball video game I've ever played, and if you play it for just like five minutes, you'll agree. I have a strange, uneasy feeling this isn't the last time I'll cross paths with a game in the Disney Sports series, but one can dream, I guess. It's just baffling to me that they managed to make so many of these of equally bad quality. I guess this is kind of an anticlimactic way to end the video, but I'm pretty grateful to not have to listen to that announcer anymore. Goofy shot is gone! Okay, did you see that? Simply amazing. Hey, thanks for watching the video. If you liked it and want to see more, there's a couple other videos right there you can check out. And if you want to keep up with everything I release, subscribe and then tap the bell icon. I also have a Patreon right there if you want to help support the channel.